Religion has profoundly influenced the sweeping American narrative, perhaps more than any other force in our history, from the time before European colonization to the present. The startup National Museum of American Religion is working to build a museum in the nation's capital that will share the story of what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion, inviting all to explore the role of religion in shaping the social, political, economic, and cultural lives of Americans and thus America itself. Join our host, Chris Stevenson, for season two of our podcast series, Religion in the American Experience, as we follow scholars deep into America's religious history and learn how it can inform and animate us as citizens grappling with complex questions of governance and American purpose in the 21st century. Episodes will be released every Monday on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Register for notifications on our website, www.storyofamericanreligion.org, under the sign-up tab. Welcome to Religion in the American Experience, a podcast series of the National Museum of American Religion. Our history is clear. Religions and their leaders have always inspired Americans during times of national tragedy and crisis with their inspiring words, their sermons that give their people hope. Today, the country faces a raging global pandemic, now going on 12 months, and its staggering effects death without loved ones near, unemployment, hunger, shuttered public schools, uncertainty, isolation, fear, and closed temples, mosques, synagogues, and churches. What counsel have religious leaders been offering to their people in the face of such a pandemic? We thought that religion and the American experience could both capture history in real time and be of service to the country by convening a panel of American religious leaders to share what they have told their congregations and believers with a broader national audience. Today's panel consists of 10 religious leaders, some with national scope and others with regional or local scope, and we thank them for their willingness to be with us. I will introduce each as we move through the hour-long discussion. The Startup National Museum of American Religion will be both the place of convening in Washington, D.C. for discussions about current national issues where religion or the idea of religious freedom is in play, as we are doing today, and the nationally recognized center for presenting, interpreting, and educating the public about what religion has done to America and what America has done to religion including the history of the revolutionary and indispensable idea of religious freedom as a governing principle in the United States. Join us in building the National Museum of American Religion in the nation's capital to open in 2026 on the 240th anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's immortal words, Almighty God hath created the mind free, capturing the American essence of religious freedom by donating at storyofamericanreligion.org forward slash contribute. For a contribution of $200 or more, you will receive a free signed copy of the book When Sorrow Comes, The Power of Sermons from Pearl Harbor to Black Lives Matter by Melissa Mathis, Professor of Government at the United States Coast Guard Academy. Her forthcoming book reminds us, or will remind us, that in the face of national crisis, faith leaders have incredible power to help Americans endure, even flourish, and further the work of improving the imperfect yet noble American experiment in self-government. Panelists, thank you so very much for being with us. We're going to start with Reverend Margaret Rose, who is the Ecumenical and Interreligious Deputy to the Presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church in New York City and she's also a priest associate at the Church of the Heavenly Rest in New York City. Reverend Rose, thank you for being with us. Uh, tell us briefly about uh, your congregation that you serve, and then what you have been saying to your people about how to endure this pandemic crisis. Thank you so much, and thank you to all 10 of us being here, because I think the kind of learning that we will have together will be something that we can offer to congregations and the faithful around the country. 
As Chris said, I serve at the national level as well as a priest associate at the Church of the Heavenly Rest in New York City. Heavenly Rest was formed just after the Civil War to give rest to returning soldiers and to a wounded country, to their families, to people who were looking for a kind of reconciliation. And it has carried that emphasis throughout its life. It's a large Episcopal church now on Fifth Avenue and 90th Street in Manhattan, New York City. And its close neighbors are Harlem, Central Park, and what is locally called the Museum Mile. Not exactly inner city, but there's a lot of traffic there. From the beginning of the pandemic, like all churches, 2020 was a moment of pivot. First and foremost, how to figure out what to do when 99% of programming with the exception of email is in person, and then how to do 99.9% .9 of programming and engagement online and virtual. From the beginning of that pandemic at Heavenly Rest, the question has not been so much what we might say that will help people endure, but how we can strengthen the community around us so that together we can endure and even flourish amid the grief and loss, especially amid the knowledge of so much that is being exposed in our country where we once thought we might be immune. Strengthening that community meant for us listening to science, telling the truth, and acting in solidarity with those most at risk. And most of all, that commitment and effort meant staying connected, to use every resource possible to do that. Old fashioned ones like old lists and phone calls and phone trees, as well as email and walking door to door. Care for those who might be alone, Communications via email were ramped up every day, offering prayers and programs and resources. And so first of all, it was connect and engage with each other. And then connect and engage with the neighborhood and the city. We created the fund for the not forgotten, sharing resources with schools, assisting neighbor parishes with technology needs, joining with other faith groups to work together to care for children who needed laptops, for example, or school lunches. Connect and engage with the world beyond ourselves, noting that this is not just a community pandemic, but a global one, and is exposing the many pandemics around the world, but mostly within our own country, of healthcare disparities, racial injustice, to name just a few. As we traveled this road together as a parish, our community was and is being transformed in those traditional ways, of course, by prayer and those ways that you might expect, but also the fact that technology somehow allowed the quiet voices, those who often said not so much in a pew, now offering webinars and forums, the stories of their lives, which helped they themselves to endure and offering those possibilities to others. What had been a rector clergy focused parish, albeit with extraordinary lay leadership, is becoming one digging deep to discover how that lay leadership works even more in partnership with clergy, expanding beyond the walls where we gather and indeed into the city and the country and beyond where we are located. This crisis has meant that we must look both deeply inward as well as beyond ourselves. We see that in a way as a sign of hope. The church-wide denominational level as well has meant that unlikely partners have been able to gather together. In the parish, we've had connections with the synagogue that we had begun, but now are even deeper than ever. At the church-wide level, virtual iftars and seders, for example, have helped us to get to know each other. Interreligious engagement has made it possible even now 
for us to partner with one another to offer our spaces for vaccines or also for COVID tests. All of these, I think, are signs of hope. And remain, even in the times that we are remaining polarized as a country, we are moving forward together. So that if we have the courage to connect, we will create not so much a new normal, but a new way of being. As Arundhati Roy said to us, this time is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging our old carcasses of prejudice and hatred, our dead banks and rivers, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. With our congregation together, we are imagining together another world with our neighbors and with those global partners that we are beginning to know in new ways. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Rose. Rabbi Jacobs. Thank you. It's an honor to be with all of you, my faith colleagues, and those who are with us uh, wherever you might be. I am Rabbi Rick Jacobs. I serve as the leader of the Union for Reformed Judaism, which is the largest and most diverse community of uh, Jews in here in North America. We were founded in 1873, right after the Civil War, so a nice connection to heavenly rest. Um, and in our name is Union. And there was anything but unity at that moment in American history. So uh, our founder, Rabbi Isaac Merwise, wanted to put it in our name to be an aspiration that we could, in fact, create more connection and more sense of common purpose. Uh, we, in the Jewish tradition, we look around and we see the brokenness everywhere we look. And we also see at the very same moment more acts of love and healing and kindness than we're trained to look at, because we tend to see the brokenness more. Our Jewish tradition teaches us that we're to be repairers of that which is broken, healers of all that ails, not just ourselves, but our community and our world. In the Hebrew Bible, in 2 Kings, there's a word for crisis. The word in Hebrew is mashber. But it literally means a birth stool, that little modest stool upon which for millennia babies were born. Now, my wife tells me I'm not allowed to comment about the pain of childbirth. I was just in the birthing room as a coach, but I can testify that the pain of childbirth throughout history has been not only overwhelming, but deadly. But what we know about that moment is also a moment of enormous possibility and hope. So at this very same moment that we are mourning so much death and experiencing so much fear and loss, we are at the very same moment experiencing perhaps a rebirth of what it might mean to be a person of faith in this 21st century. And I would just state the obvious that we have so many people here in America who are not at home yet in a faith community and maybe feel even a touch alienated. So this is a moment where we have experienced people who have not had faith commitments, but have longed for a anchor in this turbulent time. They've longed for a spiritual practice to ground every day with concrete ways to not just cope, but to find a way to thrive amidst it all. We know that this is a time when, frankly, some of the people who we long to reach as religious leaders have maybe been more open than ever before. This is a moment to extend the tent of our faith communities and maybe a moment to grow what it might mean to work together as this beautiful collection of religious leaders uh, testifies to. I also want to say that it is very possible in a moment like this just to focus in on ourselves or maybe our families or our most intimate circle of community. But I know in the Jewish tradition, we worship a God who is impatient with injustice. And so in the midst of having to very often educate our children in the very same rooms where we're trying to earn a living, that we not pause our justice work, that 
is critical to what it means to be a person of faith. And given all of the uncertainty, we know that we have to actually stand up and be counted as people who can focus not just on ourselves and our needs, but the needs of those around us, maybe some who we don't know. What we are certain of is that the death toll continues to grow and that it doesn't discriminate, and yet it does. The plague of racial injustice has been so deadly, and we know that those dying of COVID-19 are disproportionately Black and Brown and Native people. We know that essential workers on the front lines of the pandemic are often without adequate access to health care. No, we know this is a moment of racial justice uh, and a call to conscience. We know that our faith uh, has to say something about the critical issues facing our world. And if our faith, our collective faiths, don't have something to say about the, the, the killing of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, or George Floyd, then frankly, I would have to say that our faith doesn't have anything to say. And I know our faith has so much to say. We also know in this moment where our neighbor could be the one in need or the one to help us, that diversity is divine. It's not a problem. It is a gift that God has created all of us in God's image without distinction, without exception. There's a beautiful passage in the book of Zechariah, the prophet, that to me has three words that I would build, not just a homily, but a daily and weekly and monthly practice for our community. It says, love, truth, and peace. Uh, you could leave out one of those words, uh, and a lot of us maybe spend our time loving truth, which means that we could sometimes overwhelm those around us with the clarity and the certainty. Some people only want to love peace. They just want everybody to feel good, but don't want to stand for something, don't want to be accountable for the truth of what we do. But Zechariah says, love them both, bring them together. And that's the work I know of being a faith community. There's a psychologist, Richard Tedeschi, who has a theory called post-traumatic growth. We know about post-traumatic stress. We're all experiencing it, and our communities are experiencing it. Post-traumatic growth means that in traumatic experiences like a global pandemic, like a moment of racial injustice, we actually can have moments that our growth is, is catalyzed, and we are able to explore new ways of thinking, new ways of being. So I think this is a moment to reimagine what it means to be a faith community. What does it mean to know the borders of our faith and our community are not the walls of our sanctuaries, but the breath of the earth that God calls us into leadership. Uh, we, are, we are called to be not caretakers of institutions, but people who live our faith in caring lovingly for those around us, loving not just the ones who are like us, but the ones who are not like us at all, that that's part of what it means. And so I would conclude with the Judaic notion that our world is um, always in need of repair and that what we do in our daily prayer, in our faith, in our reflection, in our study, in our works of kindness to those around us, in our acts of social justice, we become partners with the Holy One to repair the world and to create a world from end to end that is filled with wholeness, compassion, joy, justice, and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobs. Pastor Davis. Awesome, so glad to be here. So my name is uh, Pastor Demetrius Davis. I am lead pastor of City Point Community Church in Chicago's South Loop neighborhood. Uh, I'm a Christian pastor. Uh, our congregation is uh, mostly made up of uh, Black millennial professionals uh, from uh, around the country. And uh, the pandemic has evolved us into what we are calling a digital first church. Um, so rather than um, what, rather than see it as problematic, the challenges that we're facing, we have decided to double down and lean into the, the opportunity that being digital has, uh, has offered to us. Um, theologically, we tend to lean toward a, a social gospel, uh, and that is this belief within Christianity that um, one must examine what one is to do as a result of one's faith. How, do, how does one impact um, the way one's neighbor lives? 
How does one impact the children in one's community? Um, the schooling opportunities, the equality opportunities that are available to everybody as a result of our beliefs. Uh, and, so, um, and so that's a bit about uh, my uh, tradition. One of the things that I have uh, encouraged our congregation in uh, from the start of the pandemic, um, there is a, uh, an Old Testament scripture from my tradition that comes from Jeremiah 29, where the people are effectively facing, uh, facing exile. And there are prophets that are telling people, the people that this will be over shortly, everything will be back to normal. Um, but then they receive this prophetic word that in actuality, you're going to be in this for a while, but the way that you should deal with it should not be to deal with it in despair, but that you should, um, you should effectively deal with it, understanding that, um, that God still has a plan for your life. And so that's a lot of what I have been encouraging our congregation around is that although we're uncertain about how all this turns out, that based on our faith, we do believe that God is certain uh, about the future, and he is certain that there will be a future. Um, and so and so I've talked to them about, I, I, I would say, just several points when I think about how I frame these things for them. One is for them to consider that, according to our belief, that God was using disaster for development. And we have absolutely been uh, seeing this in some ways, that we have been I think given an opportunity to reimagine the world that we've created, the society that we've created, I think that the pandemic gave us all a chance to be forced to slow down and to settle down and to, to rethink how we were relating to one another uh, and rethink what our priorities were as, as a nation uh, and as a world. Um, also caused us to take a, I have to take a step back and consider that as Dr. King said, what affects uh, affects any of us uh, directly affects all of us indirectly. And so we recognize that the world is a neighborhood and an outbreak in one part of the world can impact us in a different part of the world. And so the idea of isolationism, the idea of, of only thinking about what is good for us as a society uh, isn't good enough. And so I've been pressing uh, pressing that up on our congregation uh, to begin to just reimagine this world that we've created and, and ask ourselves the question, is the will of the Lord being done on earth as it is in heaven? And if not, what's the role that we need to play in shaping that um, as uh, people of faith who get a chance and get the privilege to participate in a democracy? What's the society that we are creating and is it really being informed by our beliefs? Uh, is it coming out in our vote? Is it coming out in our political participation? Is it coming out in, in the policies that we support? Uh, or are the policies that we support um, running counter to our faith? And so I've been pushing them in, in those ways. One of the second points that I've made to them was to consider that God um, may have been, as we thought about that, that story in Jeremiah, that God may have been effectively inviting them to settle into their circumstances. Um, and for us, similarly, while we have wanted the pandemic to be over quickly, we do recognize that it is not as quickly, it is has not ended quickly, and there is a settling into a new normal and deciding that we are going to live in the midst of this rather than um rather than just pack up and sit on the sidelines until things are over, but that we must continue with life, that we must um, continue to, you know, we've had congregants who have been engaged and they have, you know, realized that they couldn't have their dream wedding, but that life goes on. And so they have had their private ceremonies with three people, but that I've been just pressing upon them to continue to live uh, in the midst of this. Uh, and then finally, that delay is not denial that although the situation has extended a long time and, and it seems like we have been God forsaken or God abandoned, um, to really realize that just because we are experiencing delay does not mean that God has forgotten about us uh, in the midst of this. And so I, I've used this illustration with them and I, I'll close my time uh, by sharing it with you. Um, the movie Back to the Future, uh, predicted 
things and and in some ways it predicted some things that that actually ended up ended up happening you know some years later but what's really interesting about that movie is that in back to the future um specifically back to the future 2 they are marty and doc brown are effectively like going uh going back into the past um um, they are going back into the past with this understanding of the future and they are manipulating in some ways the past based on how they want the future to play out. I talked to them about how that there are similarities with how we believe that God operates, that while we are in this present moment struggling with the pandemic, that in actuality, he has 2025 in mind. He has plans for 2030 and understands what life looks like there. And so while we may feel hopeless at times based on our current and present experiences, realize that we do believe that we have a God that knows the future, has a plan for the future, um, and that um, that we can be hopeful in that. So thank you. Thank you, Pastor Davis, very much. Iman Majid. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be among these great leaders. Um, religious leaders. Um, I want to share with you that <clears throat> my own transformation uh, during this pandemic, I, I think I've become more, more mindful of the responsibility is given to religious leaders. I've been always mindful of it, but become more mindful of the how much uh, you know we are responsible of the well-being of people. Decision to close even the mosque for months and tell people that we will not be able to have congregation prayer because of the pandemic. That was a very heavy decision, but meant to save people's life. The responsibility of telling people the right information about the vaccine not have them to listen to fiction and WhatsApp group uh, information because have them to resist the vaccine can lead to many people losing their life. The responsibility is to serve people at the time where you cannot see your loved one because of COVID-19. And then you come as a religious leader to try to negotiate with hospitals uh, uh, you know, uh, nursing home, how can they see or how they can connect with the loved one through internet, phone, other other means. Also, responsibility of continuing to teach and to share wisdom of the scripture while people staying at home, learning how to use Zoom, learning how to use uh, a virtual space, it's not easy, and but also to counsel people, to cry with people who are grieving their loved one by seeing them only in your computer, where you cannot give them able to give them a hug. It is not easy. It was not easy for us to make sure that we deliver food to those who are in need, those who lost their jobs, and to knock on their doors, especially people who've been uh, in, impacted by COVID nineteen and to bring that food to their, to, to, their, to their door, volunteers from our community, worried about their health, worried about their safety, but all of us we thought that it's very important for us to deliver those food and the need for those who are in need. Also, I come to know that, uh, you know, my colleague, the pastor, the rabbis, they're my safety social <laughs> support been calling rabbis and pastors, you know, all the time. How are you doing? How is your community doing? And sometime I, I text a rabbi and he said to me, your text brought tears to my eyes because I just came from the cemetery who bred another loved one from our community with COVID-19. And they do the same thing for me. That's how we created a support system in this beautiful country of ours. The other things I want to say that also, it's been challenging to realize that how much we have neglected the people in need in our communities. This pandemic has exposed us, 
suppose the whole nation of the so many people who've been ignored. And that's why we need to have a vaccine against the, 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 the COVID-19, but vaccine also against racism, discriminations, and we need to bring heal the nation. And my hope, my prayer, in this moment, in the history of our beloved country, that we come together and say no more for those who've been neglected, those who have been overlooked, and we were gonna call it together because the pandemic have showed us no one is immune. And we as a community, by providing vaccine in our community clinic, by providing social service for those who are in need, we create a healthy, compassionate, caring community. Thank you, Imam Majid. Pastor Platero. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it is customary in our uh, Navajo um, way to introduce ourselves in our native language. So, so if I have any relatives out there that are watching, hello, um, I want to begin by saying that nobody warned us. Nobody said that the Navajo Nation would be hit in uh, one of the hardest, um, would be one of the hardest hit areas in America. Nobody warned us that we would lose people at a disproportionate rate, um, more above any other people group um, in, in, in our nation. Nobody said that we would lose uh, a good majority of our senior pastors and lead pastors all across the Navajo Nation. Nobody told us that we would have to uh, shelter in place uh, for days on end and uh, almost uh, get to a point where we were rationing our food. Nobody told us that. Um, we would be losing um, great elders, great leaders, great thinkers of our people group. Uh, nobody warned us. And when we were hit with the virus uh, and when it hit, hit us, it hit us hard. Not only did we um, begin to rethink who we were as a, um, as a people, we began to think about um, what our next steps were and what we were going to do to uh, mitigate the, the spread of the the pandemic on our Navajo Nation. Imagine if you would uh, living in a in conditions akin to a third world country and uh, knowing your neighbors um, are miles and miles away. And then imagine uh, having to check on those neighbors and finding them uh, deceased in their households. These are some of the stories that we um, had to deal with with the, uh, the pandemic here on Navajo. And as we began to uh, see the uh, tragedies unfold, we begin to um, uh, we begin to lose hope. We begin to be reminded that uh, sometimes uh, Navajo people and First Nations people, the host people of the land uh, of America, are sometimes a forgotten people, are sometimes people that are pushed aside and maybe not thought of in, 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 in the way that we would like to be. And then imagine if you would, people turning their attention to us on national news and inviting us into panels like this and saying, we want you to be a part of the discussion because you're not forgotten, because we see you and we understand you. Imagine people saying thank you for being the host people of the land and for inviting us into uh, the, the conversation. As we began to uh, think about these things and, and, and see these things unfold all across Navajo, uh, we began to get a, a sense of hope and a sense of uh, longing for uh, times that were, were better than uh, what we were seeing in front of us. Um, one of the big things that I've encouraged my, my people to do, my uh, congregation isn't as um, diverse as some of yours. Uh, my congregation isn't that uh, as big as, as some of you, but, um, you know, my sphere of influence uh, revolves around those that are young. Um, and I struggled a lot with what to say to them. I struggled a lot with what uh, to inspire within them, having seen all of the travesty around Navajo, but then uh, having to be the one to inspire hope. And the one thing that came to mind was a verse from 1 Peter, uh, which reads <clears throat> uh, in uh, 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each one of us have had a, a tremendous amount of um, 
uh, ways that we've responded to the pandemic. And we've seen so many uh, Navajo people step up. Uh, and we was for so many days, we, for so many years, we've been uh, seen as a mission field. And now we're being seen as a mission force. And that was my encouragement to young people, uh, to people all across our land that um, as hard as we have been hit, uh, we have an obligation as the host people of the land uh, to go out, to begin to uh, help one another, regardless of um, faith, regardless of uh, uh, orientation, uh, one way or the other. Um, we are called to help people, to serve people. Our faith demands that we meet the physical needs and the spiritual needs of people. And so uh, it's been a tremendous, the, the one thing I can say to uh, all of us here and those listening is that the Navajo Nation, um, those First Nation uh, people of the land, that uh, we are mobilizing, that we are caring for you, that we hold you in our prayers, that we uh, we see you as, as you have seen us and as, as you have sent aid, we are sending aid. And what a tremendous hope to give to people that we can change the, the direction, we can turn the head of our nation if we come together, if we mobilize, if we begin to uh, take up the great responsibility that we've been given. And uh, I, I, I want to say to you all on, on this panel how honored I am to be uh, among you, how honored I am to have a voice in this, because you are saying by virtue of listening to me and by virtue of uh, having uh, this conversation that uh, our, my people, the Navajo people, are not forgotten um, and that you are inviting us into the conversation. So I want to thank you for that. From the bottom of my heart, I want to say in our native language, yeah, with great gratitude, I, I give this report to you. Um, so thank you all and uh, God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Platero. And I failed uh, to introduce our panelists, so I'm going to take a minute and uh, tell you who has spoken to us. That was Pastor Platero. He's the chaplain at Broken Arrow Bible Ranch on the Navajo Nation. Before him was Imam Majid. He is the executive religious director at the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, or Adams Center in Sterling, Virginia. Before Imam Majid was Pastor Demetrius Davis, lead pastor at City Point Community Church in Chicago. And then before that was Rabbi Jacobs, reform rabbi and the president of the Union for Reform Judaism. And before that was Reverend Rose, and I believe I did introduce her. So we'll go now to Reverend Glenn Colonel. He's Muscogee ceremonial leader and executive director of the Native American Comprehensive Plan of the United Methodist Church and he's in Oklahoma City. Reverend Colonel. Thank you, Chris. Um, as my relative, uh, Pastor Platero was saying, it is customary to do our, our introductions in our language so that all of our ancestors and those who may be watching will know who we represent and who we speak of. Chuban Colonel Choho Chifkados, Halobi Kanidia Dolwa, Olegade Hutkin Legat, Hadok Gogi, Omalegade Dowa. And so just shared with you a little bit of my responsibilities uh, to my community of Muscogee people and Seminole people of Oklahoma, and also just letting you know who my clan relatives are uh, in that little uh, few lines that I, I shared with you. Um, it is my pleasure, once again, as everyone has said, to, to be here with each of you relatives talking about the impact of this pandemic on our respective communities, and I'm um, particularly touched by our, our Diné relatives and our Navajo people and what they've gone through. And I'm thankful for the, the presence of Pastor Platero and others that have labored through what um, much of the world is just now beginning to understand what we go through as Native American people day to day. Because unfortunately, this isn't the only trauma that we face day in and day out. And really, when we think about what have we been sharing in terms of our message to our people, um, you know, as a community for, for myself and, and my role, having served um, over the past 20 years in two capacities as a, a pastor of a church, but right now in more of an administrative role where I'm responsible for training all of our communities within the United Methodist structure that impact Native American and Indigenous peoples. Um, you know, it's very, we have to be very honest in what we try to say because before we can get into anything prescriptive of what we can be in ministry and in life, we have to be descriptive. We have to describe actually the trauma that we're going through day in and day out. And that's really what we're facing today when we think about we're just now getting the statistics 
on how this pandemic is hitting people of color throughout the United States, and it is heartbreaking. I think even one of our institutes just uh, yesterday put out uh, a statistic of how that 35% of COVID-related deaths are from young people, Native Americans under the age of 60, which is quite opposite of what you see going on across the country. You know, we, we already know, you know, the six times or seven times higher rates of infections in Native American communities. And the reality is much of our people, uh, much of the world, I should say, has, doesn't quite realize what that means. For communities that represent 1% of the population, we're making up an enormous percent of the people that are actually getting sick from the virus. And even as I've been on call after call, conference after conference, I've actually implored of people to realize that I'm not so sure what our community will look like when we're past this point, that we have to at least acknowledge at some level the trauma that we're going through. Even just a, a couple of weeks ago, I was called to do, and I know this is how pastors and clergy all over uh, the Native American communities are, are, are what they're going through. I was called to do four funerals in the amount of eight days. And three of those, of course, were COVID related. One was one of just our elders had passed away. But we're still called into situations where we might find ourselves, um, I'm not going to say put in harm's way, but um, where we might be exposed to this virus. And for our world, you know, one of the things that it's very difficult for us to understand a cosmology that's different than looking at the intimate communication between human to human and human to creation is that our churches, our communities, we're kind of hybrid in our understanding of the world and our faith is that number one, we do have for those that are finding a spiritual home in Christianity, they do have tenets in Christianity that are very much the same as what we've heard on our call. But we also possess spiritualities that um, you know, we've been performing and engaging in understandings of the world that have been in place for uh, thousands of years. And it's those things that are still tugging at us for we when we look at a Zoom call or a meeting such as this, it seems somewhat artificial. So we tend to want to be in each other's presence, to be in each other's, uh, you know, to see each other, to talk to each other. And that's one of the things that we have continued to do, you know, throughout the country. And unfortunately, it has had a, an enormous impact on our um, on our health and well-being. As uh, Pastor Platero has said, many of our ministers have have passed on, and even in our many of our communities here in Oklahoma, um, it has been the, the the same thing. So we've been trying to the message that we've been trying to share is that because we might uh, we're going to believe in science and what's being said um, from from uh, reputable sources, it doesn't take away from our faith. To not go and meet in person in church settings, it's not going to take away from our faith. And this has been a work in progress. It has been, you know, a little bit of a, a teaching that we've had to engage in to say it's going to be okay if, you know, if we don't have a, a Sunday morning service that might expose us to the virus unnecessarily. Um, but I must say, there's challenges. You know, not all of us have the, the the computer hardware to be on a Zoom call. Not all of us even have um, a, a cell phone reception to even have a, a, an internet connection. We have relatives in ministries uh, all over the country. Sometimes they have to drive about an hour to get a, a good connection to even make a call. So these are the kind of challenges that we are facing. So we're just trying to say, though, take it seriously. Take the numbers that we see seriously. You know, we're trying to provide for our community the, the quality information, such as our imam, our imam was sharing about, you know, trusting the vaccine, trusting, you know, the, the recommendations from the CDC, things of that nature, and saying this is something that's going to be okay. And the message that parallels with that message about science is also a message of faith, that things will not always be this way. This will not last forever. And even reminding our communities in Native American uh, churches and uh, uh, faith community, spirituality groups, whatever it may be, that even the way that we're living in more of a, I'm not going to say isolated, but in smaller communities, is how indigenous peoples have overcome so many obstacles over the centuries. 
that it's okay to stay amongst your family. It's okay to, you know, to be there for your children day in and day out. And even as myself, I have young people in the other room that I have to go with their elementary lessons here in just a little bit for school. It's okay to do that. And in fact, that's a gift that is being given to us that sometimes even someone like myself has overseen because I was jumping on an airplane, going across the country, going to another meeting, doing this. It's okay to do that. And so that's what we're hoping is that we can be reminded of all of those things, of using our, our language with our children, using uh, you know this way of, of living and existing with our, our families and strengthening us and that this moment in time won't be forever, that there will be a day when we can see each other again. There will be a day when we can embrace again. And that's not going to be um, you know, too far in the future that, uh, that there will be that time when we can break bread together once again, as we have in the past. And so those are kind of the messages that we're trying to share and bring home to our communities. Pat, Reverend Colonel, thank you very much. Let's turn now to Pastor Jim Dennison. He is the pastor at Harbor Chapel at Possum Kingdom Lake and the president of Dennison Forum in Dallas, Texas. Pastor. Uh, thank you, Chris. Such a privilege to be in this conversation with these leaders from across faith traditions, demonstrating the, the unity of our humanity and uh, our need for hope and for faith together. I serve a global uh, online community as well as a local community. And uh, my message has been in many ways similar to that of Pastor Davis, who spoke of God using disaster for development. I've been encouraging us to look for ways that God redeems what he allows. I'm convinced that we serve a redeeming God. He is holy. He is all loving. He is all powerful. He is sovereign. I'm convinced, therefore, that his character requires him to redeem for greater good all that he allows or causes. I'm not suggesting we understand that redemption this side of heaven. We look through a glass darkly, but one day face to face. I don't understand the internet. I don't understand airplanes. I don't have to understand to believe that and to look for ways that God is redeeming even this horrific crisis. So how could he be doing that? In our tradition, we obviously focus on Jesus as our good shepherd, as he spoke of himself. And I've been thinking of Jesus in the context of the 23rd Psalm and the shepherd that we find there and the three ways that Jesus shepherds us. First, he goes before us. The Psalm speaks of God leading us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Then he goes beside us. The Psalm speaks of God being with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will fear no evil for you are with us. The psalmist speaks of God going behind us. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. So we've been focusing on ways that Jesus is redeeming this pandemic by going before us and beside us and behind us. He's going before us. He's leading us. He's leading people to himself. Uh, he's using the horrific mortality of these days to show people their need for faith, their need for hope, their need for something beyond themselves. I know of a church in California that had 8,000 in their online services before the pandemic, 1.2 million online for Easter Sunday. Read the other day of the leader of the Evangelical Alliance in the UK, who says that typically about 5% of the British people are in church before the pandemic, 20% had been in online services. God redeeming this, leading us to himself. He's redeeming this by being beside us and calling us to be his representatives and the Christian tradition to be the body of Christ, to be his hands and feet. As other faith leaders have said, this has been an opportunity, a, a horrific opportunity to walk with hurting people, to demonstrate God's grace in ours, his compassion in ours, to reach out to people and to show them God's compassion for them. As Pastor Paterno talked about, to, to say that none of us are forgotten, that God knows us in all of our languages and knows us in all of our need. And we can be the presence of God in places of hurt. And then last, to trust him with our own hurt with our own pain, to know that he's going behind us, that when we don't see him, he sees us. When it's hard to trust him and understand him, he still understands us. One of my favorite movie scenes is from that uh, place in the Count of Monte Cristo where the prisoner says to the priest, I don't believe in God. And the priest says, that's okay. He still believes in you. And so it's this invitation to trust God, to go before us and lead us, to go beside us, and redeem our pain and even go behind us and surround us with his grace has been the message, the encouragement, uh, looking for all the ways that God redeems what he allows. 
And then last, to claim the promise at the end of that famous psalm, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is God's invitation. That is God's promise. And that's the promise that we're claiming in these really tough days. So it's a real privilege to share that and to share this time and this conversation with the rest of you. Thank you, Pastor Dennison. Let's uh, move to Pastor uh, Ramos, although I think... I'm here. Thank you so much for this opportunity yeah, okay. uh, to be part of this group. Um, I'm a pastor of a bilingual church that represents around eight uh, different countries, uh, Latin countries. And one of the things that um, that I tell the church, uh, knowing that most Latin countries will emerge um, in, with uh, the concept uh, and understanding that um, that superstitious is part of the culture, uh, that entails sometimes fear. So I tell them that that uh, we, our experience, what psychology is called the effectively heuristic, is a concept which says that people make decisions based out of, of events that causes fear. And I am dealing with that situation, trying to, to find out um, uh, how to help the church when it comes to fear. I told the church that we should not fear the coronavirus, but our Lord. And as, as the COVID-19 crisis continues, there is there's one thing that, that uh, we must be very vigilant about, and that is depression, um, both in our children and in ourselves. Uh, feeling depressed in times of, of, of force, inactivity, and, and constant uncertainty is inerrable. And most of us are struggling to stay positive. Um, so I encourage the church to continue to seek God in, in the midst of these tragedies. And, and one of the questions that, uh, that constantly I hear from the church is, is God punishing us? I don't know. Some of my colleagues have heard that before, but I, but I have, and and, uh, and I try to tell the church that first of all we must bear in mind that God continues to have control of history and nature, and I think it is good that the church is the first to recognize this, believe this, and and announce it. Uh, there are many biblical passages that speaks of the sovereignty of God and His intervention through throughout the history of mankind. Um, throughout history, God has always spoken to us. In many ways, according to Hebrew 1.12, and the message was always centered toward the people of Israel and later to the early church. For example, the message to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation is not for the world, but it is for the church. So today I tell the promised church while well, pastor, God is speaking to us again, and this time in a, in a different, unusual way, but always within the scope of his sovereignty, and it is highly e efficient. This puts us before the challenge of, of making a deep analysis of what has been done, of how we have fulfilled the mission and carry out the will of God. And in that sense, we must make no less reflection. I told you what we must consider is the first in first place that that within the permanency will, God allowed COVID-19. And the first thing he points out to us is how fragile we are, how weak we are as human beings, and how vulnerable we are. And the Bible says that a fool is he who trusts in himself, Proverbs 28, 26. Instead, he counsels us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and not in your own understandings, Proverbs 3, 5. The church is not ours, I tell the promise. It is God. He is the Lord and head of the church and therefore continues continues uh, uh, with the history and, 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 and with our lives maintaining the control of everything. Secondly, I, I read an article by one of, one of, of the evangelicals named John Piper that tells us that with, with uh, the coronavirus crisis, as with all other calamities, God is given the role a physical representation of the moral atrocity and spiritual ugliness of the world, sin that dis despises God. So I told the church that sin continued to be the source of the world's calamities and uh, atrocities, and this shows us the consequence of sin. Uh, the Apostle Paul summarized it in a masterly way in Romans 5, 12, where he says, through one man, sin enters the world, and through sin enters dead. This is how dead happens to all humanity, because all has sin. And finally, I tell the church that COVID-19 shows us a new revela um, revelation in the most exact sense of the term. God was surprisingly able to get our attention 
Beyond the theological position of each one in relation to the last things, we must recognize that we live in a time that is not necessarily apocalyptic, but yes, we are in an apocalypse revelation necessity for the church. God began to reveal to us a perspective of the church more similar to that of his heart than to our personal or institutional appreciation. That is why, in short, as I conclude, we return to the starting point, to the church in the houses, to a more personal relationship with God, to a faith not mediated by development, but by the work of the Holy Spirit. So I told the promised church, God is still in control in the midst of this pandemic crisis. Thank you. Pastor Ramos, thank you very much. Uh, let's move to Father uh, Dominguez. He is the program director at the Don Bosco Center Youth Apostles of the Catholic Diocese of Arlington in Arlington, Virginia. Father. Thank you very much. I am also honored to be a part of this uh, conversation and sharing. Um, I'm a priest, as was mentioned, in the Catholic Church, and I run a program that works with uh, principally um, at-risk Hispanic uh, young people uh, after school, mostly grades five through uh, high school. Uh, however, I also serve at a number of other uh, parishes, churches in, in the Northern Virginia area. Um, and, uh, basically, we, we accompany these young people as they uh, make their way through this earth towards, obviously, towards their heavenly uh, goal. So I want to begin with just a little passage from, from Hebrews, Hebrews 6, 19. Um, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and reliable and one which enters within the veil. Um, as has been said, this time of pandemic is, um, has turned ordinary conventions upside down. And, and even the young people whom I work with um, are longing for that hu human, genuine human interaction. Uh, that that they would get even you know at school you know God forbid that they want to go to school and their friends and other social activities. Uh, my message to them has been one of encouragement, as well as one that has sought out to uh, put in place structures that have helped them to stay connected yet also to remain safe. Um, I've seen good people of faith unite together uh, to serve those who have been adversely impacted. We had you know some that would start up food distribution centers, you know, just on their own. They're not part of a, a church or something. They just felt it was the right thing to do. Uh, and they've done that. And, and they're helping uh, feed people, hundreds of people. Um, we've also helped to set up um, students, uh, virtual learning centers, or they come uh, to our after-school program. And we, we help them to, to learn by providing um, other staff to help them to navigate this uh, thing. I mean, they're, they're used to video games, but it's different when you actually have to learn something that's being taught to you that's not always the most exciting. Um, there have been great losses uh, due to death, as well as losses in support of loved ones, uh, those who are isolated because they're older, or they're in different places that you're not able to access. That's that's been very traumatic. Even, even just travel has been difficult. Like, you know, going to see your grandparents, for example, in a different country, a lot of the restrictions have impeded this, this movement that would have been very normal and natural and supportive. But there have also been unexpected blessings. Uh, some of these virtual platforms have, have allowed uh, me, for example, to be able to connect more uh, readily with uh, people who are further away from a physical distance and, and draw them in uh, to conversations and to sharing and being more a part of the, their life. Um, and we also, uh, my message also includes, that, you know, we can certainly see the hand of God uh, present in the world from the success of the rapid deployment of the, the new vaccine to uh, awakening of many for their need to pray to look beyond the material goods and the routine of things in this world. Um, all too often, it's it's been very easy to say, you know, well, it's too easy, too, too busy to pray and, you know, to care for each other. Now they're looking with social venues shutting down and other normal things that kind of clutter our lives. Um, people look and say, wow, you know, I, I need something that is real. I need something that's true, something beyond the veneer of social media and things like that. Symbol that I like, uh, to, to speak to is, is the anchor, uh, the anchor as a symbol of hope. Um, when you look at that, it's a, it's a hope that's not very theoretical. It's a hope that's uh, solidly grounded. 
Um, for example, you know, in the tempest that is the world, you know, the ship being our life, you know, when you look at anchors and ships, you know, when there's a big hurricane or something coming, the ships don't stay in the harbor. It's actually a dangerous place for them. They head out to sea and they, they drop their anchors out there because if they're in the harbor, they can get damaged on the pier or on the shore and different things can happen. And they head out and they drop their anchor out there. And we see in the Bible uh, time and time again how uh, Jesus walks in the midst or is present in the midst of times of uh, tempests and oceans and storms. And he's there calm. And, you know, the disciples call to him and he says, I got this. And, and so, you know, as a Christian, I encourage them uh, to, to put their faith, their hope in Jesus Christ. Uh, that time and time again, you know, we, we just need to go back to that idea of connecting to him, holding on to that line that is connected to our anchor, the one that, that helps us, you know, as the, as the Bible says, you know, his strength, strength and his grace are enough for us. I've encouraged the, my community to, to, to hold on to that hope that things will move and God has a plan for each of us in these difficult moments. Um, I also believe that we must do so together. Um, as a people of faith, we are called to look beyond ourselves uh, and to see in our brothers and sisters that image of Christ. Um, and as we, if we live and love in this way, then we make a difference and we act as a beacon of hope in this world. And so I can close with another quote from Romans 5, 13, 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Father Dominguez. So lastly, we'll turn to Sister Melanie Tagg, who is the president of the Ashburn, Virginia Stake Relief Society of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Ashburn, Virginia. Melanie. Thank you, Chris. What a beautiful hour this has been. I have, I have learned from each of you. I have felt uplifted by you and through ways that I believe are only divine. I feel a love for you people that I've never met and even more so for the wonderful people that you serve. Um, our, our Relief Society is an organization of women whose primary aim is to ease human suffering, relief, to give relief to others. We are, we are seven plus million strong around the world and I have the humble blessing of leading about 1,200 of those good women locally here in Northern Virginia. I would say that the primary message that we share is one that is not unique to the Christian tradition, but is certainly the foundation of the Christian tradition. And that is the two great commandments, the commandment to love our God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength, and to then in turn love our neighbor. We have, we have encouraged our members in the interest of loving their God and in their grief at not being able to meet together in sanctuaries and chapels and temples to look to find ways to make their home, whether they live there individually or with a group, a sanctuary as much as possible, a place of prayer, a place of fasting individually and collectively, um, and a place of learning place of gospel learning, and that we believe, like all the rest of you, that when those are our devotions, God empowers us and enables us to withstand the challenges, this pandemic being one great example um, that, that beset us. A, a specific practice that our prophet encouraged us during this pandemic to practice that I found personally moving, as I know millions of others did, and that was to practice gratitude openly and on a daily basis. And it's counterintuitive and it's amazing that in our extremity, as we express gratitude openly and outwardly, we find that all things do work together for good for those that love the Lord, that in fact, uh, he can sanctify our sufferings to our benefit and to the benefit of those around us. I don't speak Greek so I'm not sure that what I'm about to say uh, has a good foundation in the Greek, but in the New Testament where it says to love the Lord and as the first great commandment and that the second one is like unto it, in my mind in English, what I hear is the second one is just like it. The second one is the same as it. 
So in some way that I can't describe, but that I have experienced, when I love my neighbor, I know my Lord. They go together. They cannot be separated. We have encouraged our dear members to love their neighbor by wearing a mask, by getting vaccinated, by socially distancing in practical secular ways. But we've more um, extremely encouraged them to seek ways to, to directly ease human suffering, small and large. As a church, we have sent humanitarian aid around the world um, but I'm more moved by smaller and simpler acts of kindness. Um, Rabbi Jacob's reference to the fact that sometimes we are the givers of aid and sometimes we are the receivers of aid is not lost on me. The, the beautiful Christian New Testament parable of the, of the Good Samaritan teaches us that sometimes in our lives we identify with the man taken of thieves in the ditch. And sometimes we identify with the Samaritan who pours in the oil. The, to me, the beautiful nexus point that we offer to our members between loving God and loving our neighbor is to encourage them to go to their God and ask him, who can I help? Which neighbor can I run to and how can I help them? This sometimes is institutionally huge and we affiliate ourselves with big, strong, good projects. And it sometimes is um, minuscule if that's all we have to offer. Uh, neither is lost, and each is powerful and eternally significant. Um, I, I, uh, I am not thankful for a pandemic, but I am thankful to a God that has sanctified a pandemic to the good of those that love him and seek in that love to love every neighbor within their circle in ways large and small. Thanks again for a great hour. And I offer that message to you in Christ and in love. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Melanie Tag. We have been listening to a panel of 10 American religious leaders share what they have told their own congregations and believers about facing the pandemic with a broader national audience. This is just a snapshot of what American religious leaders have always done to help a country in crisis. Listeners, please join us in building the National Museum of American Religion in the nation's capital to open in 2026 on the 240th anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's immortal words, Almighty God hath created the mind free, capturing the American essence of religious freedom by donating at storyofamericanreligion.org forward slash contribute. Again, for a contribution of $200 or more, you will receive a free signed copy of the book, When Sorrow Comes, The Power of Sermons from Pearl Harbor to Black Lives Matter by Mel Melissa Mathis, professor of government at the United States Coast Guard Academy. Her forthcoming book will remind us, as we have been reminded today, that in the face of national crisis, faith leaders have an incredible power to help Americans endure and even flourish and further the work of improving the imperfect yet noble American experiment in self-government. Uh, to each of you faith leaders, thank you so very much for being with us today and sharing your beliefs and ideas on how your people and really the entire country can endure the pandemic that now moves into its second year. Thank you very much. The podcast series, Religion in the American Experience, is a project of the National Museum of American Religion. Episodes are released each Monday on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Register for notifications on our website, www.storyofamericanreligion.org, under the sign-up tab.